we've all dealt with stereotypes of women in a male-dominated industries, including college sports. Um, talk about uh, the challenges of working against those stereotypes. I mean, Robin, I mean, you're like one, one step below a moonshot, aren't you? I mean, in NASA or math, um, <laughs> Andy, television. I mean, I can imagine um, who your bosses in the atmosphere were. Just maybe talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, I, I noticed over the course of my career seeing a couple of words consistently pop up, and one was aggressive and one was bossy. And I, I'm pretty sure that my male counterparts, instead of being called aggressive, would be called assertive. Instead of being called bossy, would be called decisive. And I think that we do a real disservice when we let preconceived kind of gender expectations weigh in on our views of people as leaders. The flip side of that is I've had male colleagues be hindered as well because they're more low ebb, more type B. Like I'm super type A and I'm gonna jump your ass sometimes for sure, but I'm not aggressive. My male counterparts have been criticized for being, you know, hey, you need to be more macho, you need to be more dominant, and they're just as hurt by that. I think we need to let leaders lead that's in line with their personality and just shape them into the best they can be. I'll tell a funny, well, it's not funny, but it's a memorable story. Um, we had just left University of Arizona to go to Rice, and our daughters were about four and five, and I was driving them one day to swim lessons. And my daughter says, um, we were coming home, and you know, I said, how was your lesson? What happened? And she says, oh, Coach Dave was asking about Dad. And I thought, okay, well, maybe he figured out he was the new AD at Rice or something. And I said, well, what did he ask? She says, well, he, he asked what Daddy did. And I said, what did you tell him? Because I didn't know if she understood what an athletic director meant or that word or those, that, that title or anything. And she says, well, I told him he worked at Rice and he was the athletics director. And I said, okay. And uh, I said, did he ask what mommy did? And she says, no. And before I could say anything, she says, because daddy's the important one. She was five. And I have no idea why she thought daddy was the quote, important one when it came to work. So of course I pulled over quickly, <laughs> <laughs> turned around and said, why is daddy the important one? And she said, because he gets dressed every day and goes to work. And I think she saw me kind of stay in my yoga pants <laughs> and go into my office and write. But to her, she had this notion that daddy was the important one. So I don't know. And that was five. So I don't know where that came from. I've been in this business with Arthur for 20 years, over 20 years. Um, and I have worked, worked and worked and worked. Um, and then I had Aaron and he asked me one day when I told him I was going back to work, well, who's gonna take care of me? And I said, I'm gonna take care of you. I'm still gonna take care of you. Just because I have a job doesn't mean I'm not gonna be available for you. I'm still gonna take care of you and daddy. And he was in kindergarten, similar age, when I went back to work and it was part time. But he was really concerned about, we know daddy's not here, so, if you're going to be working too, what, what about me? So I had to explain to him, mommies can do, mommies can work and take care of the families, <laughs> and you're going to be just fine. Can you all speak a little bit about uh, how you find a voice um, in a room where, again, just by numerics, it's very likely that there aren't a whole lot of people that are our gender or look like us or sound like us, and how do you find your voice and your your power, if you will, for what you do and how to contribute. It takes practice. I don't think anyone sits down at a table full of people that don't look like them in a new environment and they nail it. Again, at this point in my career, the thing that I try to do is now that I have a seat at the table, push to make sure I'm getting other people in because we get stuck in comfort zones. It's checking the, the leaders and the deciders and who's sending out the invites. Do we have the right people in here? It can't just be enough now that I'm here. Yay, like, the, okay, I need to make sure that Andrea is here and, you know, who, the smartest people and the most capable people, not just the people we're used to working around. I think that's good, the ability to assess an arena, like home games are easier than away games, right? So where's the, where's the meeting? Is it in your office? Is it somebody else's office? What are the dynamics and the numbers of what you're trying to prove and what you're trying to do? Um, who's supporting you, who's not? And trying to really critically think about what's going on and where's the awareness in the room 
And I think there's an educational component to it also of you were hired or in that situation to do a job and being the best at that, no matter if you're male, female, but continuing to stay up on that. And when it's your turn to speak, not just speaking to speak, of knowing what you're talking about. And that comes with practice. And I think that comes with continual learning. But then also sometimes you've got to say, hey, I've got something to say. Like not afraid to step in and use your voice, like literally to interrupt the conversation. Because I think sometimes naturally it can be forgot about in that sense, but just asserting yourself in that situation as well. When I graduated college, I was working at General Electric in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. They have a really big aerospace facility there. And in my first position there, there were 52 people in our office, um, 50 males and two females. There was myself and the other female was our administrative assistant. So we would be in meetings and we'd be around tables of you know, eight, 10 or 12 people. And all of the men were my dad's age and older. And it was interesting, and I think about this now in retrospect with a whole different mindset, of how shocked some of the men would look when I would offer an idea or suggest something. Andy, being in a similar position working in athletics with a family and children, I get a lot of questions from the women in our department who are in high level positions with families and give them my advice. Sure. How do you balance being a mother with children and the schedule that you have to fulfill? So I think balance is a good word. I think that what I get asked a lot that frustrates me is how do you do it all? Because the answer is I don't, you know? If we had Del Conte and Herman and Shaka Smart and Arthur up here, we wouldn't ask them, how do you do your job and be an awesome dad? Because no one expects that. They can just be awesome at their job and secondarily they can be a partner and a father. Um, so I think we need to let go of that expectation that it's always gonna be balanced. Early in my career, when I was at work, I felt guilty for not being at home. And then when I was at home, I was stressed out that someone was outworking me and that people thought I didn't have a strong work ethic. I've tried to allow myself some grace now and just concentrate on the thing at hand. So if I'm at work, I'm trying to do the best I can. When I'm at home, I'm just trying to raise kids that aren't total jick jacks. You know, like the expectations aren't through the roof. It's just like, do the best I can and let go of this like, I'm going to have it all. You're not. Just do the best you can. Because, you know, I particularly work with 18 to 22 year olds, as a lot of you do, what would you have told your 18 to 22 year old self? I think just be a person of excellence. And I think that just carries from being at home to school to the workplace and out in the community. Just be a person of excellence. I think you need to take chances. I think a lot of times women want to be 100% ready for that next opportunity sorry men in the room and men are like I'll wing it let's go we're gonna do this we're gonna try it um, it's and I such think a great point I have struggled with that and as I've grown up and gotten more gray hairs um, that's oh girl they're all right here okay um, but I think that's something is taking risks and be okay to do that at 18 at 22 at 24 and I think that's helped me get to where I am because I moved from a consistent job in marketing where it wasn't dependent on wins and losses or a specific human and I was like you know what if I look back you know I moved that jump to football and I knew if I looked back I would regret that decision and that was a risk I was willing to take at that point. So I have a dad of four girls and I work with female athletes what would be your advice for for little girls coming up or even college athletes how do you build confidence self-esteem as a woman and how do you re regain that? So two questions if you've lost it. I think confidence is built through reps, whatever those reps are, whether it's putting yourself out there, public speaking, whether it's volleyball, whatever. Confidence is built through reps. I also think that sometimes people see things in, our, in us that we don't see in ourselves. So as a dad, if you see things about your daughter's characteristics that you need to really magnify them for them, you know, really focus on whatever those great characteristics of those girls are, really show that dad really really sees it and what they can do with that. And also bringing women into their world that are doing all kinds of amazing things. 